Uh, I'm Norm Quadra. Um, been a judge, uh, city of uh, Swanee, for about nine years. Uh, in total, I've been a judge for about 18 years uh, with the city of Chambly, city of Doraville. I've served with uh, the famous Scott Carter right there. Um, and I've been on the, originally I was on the Commission on Interpreters in 2010, and most recently, uh, as of 2021, I was appointed by Justice McMillan to um, join the Standing Judicial Committee on Court Interpreters. Is that the right thing? Close enough. Yeah, close enough. Uh, and I was appointed chair of the Rules Committee, so Mr. Paul Panuski is an advisor also on the, on the committee as well. He is a sign language interpreter. You want, you want to just tell him about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm a, an attorney in the metro Atlanta area. Um, before I was an attorney, I was an American Sign Language interpreter. Um, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was like, oh, I'll just learn a language. That's super easy. Um, so I uh, became an American Sign Language interpreter, and I became a court interpreter. Uh, and there are not a lot of those, and we're definitely going to talk about that today. Uh, just so you know, in Georgia, there are only 10 American Sign Language interpreters that are certified to be in court. Lots of other people can be, and we'll get into that, but it's, it's a very small number, and that's going to pose a challenge. Uh, but I've been an American Sign Language interpreter for about 15 years. Uh, now that I'm a practicing attorney, I'm the only attorney that's fluent in sign language, so I have a lot of deaf clients. Uh, and even though I don't interpret that much, I still stay connected with the community. I keep up my, my certification, uh, and I am on committees and boards that deal with access to justice and providing interpreters. So Paul and I have basically been in... Uh Recruited, I guess is the right word. Voluntold. Voluntold. Voluntold to do presentations on the new uh, court interpreter rules. Uh, this June, we finally got approved. Uh, took us about 18 months of writing and, and phone calls and conferences and tweaking, which we're still doing. Actually, as of about maybe about two weeks ago, yep. we we're still tweaking the rules. Uh, but we finally got a, a pretty good, concise set of rules on how to deal with interpreters, how, to, how they can be uh, uh, certified, their level, uh, how to use an interpreter, when to use an interpreter, uh, who pays for an interpreter, and we're going to try to use all these things. But we're actually going to be presenting this to pretty much all the levels of court. So where's your next one? You're doing... Uh, November 2nd and 3rd, um, yeah. down in St. Simon's Island. Yeah, so he's, he's going to be a traveling guy. And, yeah, we're going to be visiting. But right now they're recording this. So one of the things that we're going to do is ask questions. Please ask questions. We like a hot bench, you know, <laughs> right? We like to hear questions. We like to know, you know, if you guys are getting this, if you guys have any problems. But please, please, please ask questions. Uh, even the softball questions, I think I... I Asked Cheryl to ask, I was going to ask her the question, what's the speed of a sw swooping swallow? And she was supposed to say European or African. Monty Python? No? I didn't get it either. It's yeah. okay. Oh, well. <laughs> some, some get it. Some as long not. as you get my jokes, that's the only thing that matters <laughs> to me. Um, okay, so we're going to ask you questions too. Uh, and we're going to start off with the most important question is, as, as courts, as judges, why do we need an interpreter? Does anybody want to take a stab at the, at the answer? Make sure someone understands your rights. Okay. Make sure someone understands your rights. That's what you said, right? Anybody else? Satisfied due process. Ooh. Satisfied due process. Good answer. Good one. Access to courts. Access, Access to courts. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. We, all of these are good answers. The first answer, though, is just the right it's thing, the to, right do. thing to do. I mean, honestly, it doesn't, no matter, we have all these answers, we're going to get into all of these, but it is the right thing to do for all of these reasons. Why not, right? Yeah. Um, and specifically, the things we're going to go through quickly in this section is federal and state constitutions, federal and state laws and regulations, federal and state case and common law, court and local rules, all of these things, especially the judges, these are all the reasons that we're told to do them, but ultimately it still comes down to... It's the right thing to it's do. It's the right thing to do. All right. So we had everybody right. clapping last yeah. time. All right. They, they did it's the right so, thing to do. Well, right before we <laughs> presented, there was this like motivational speaker, which talk about the worst act to follow, right? Like the motivational speaker. And then they had snacks and everybody was tired. But he had this thing where he like made them clap in unison three times and I stole it. <laughs> All right. First thing we, we have is uh, Fifth Amendment due process. Uh, obviously, the right to notice. You have a right to know what's going on. You have a right to be informed. 
of you know whatever court proceeding you're in. Next one is obviously a Sixth Amendment right. You have a right to participate, actively participate in your defense, talk to your attorney, uh, get advice, know what's going on with your attorney, and interact. And obviously your right to confront witnesses. And Judge Quadra is going to get into that a little bit more, but just think about that for a second. If you can't communicate with your attorney, how can there be effective assistance of counsel? If you literally cannot communicate, how does anybody know what's going on? And what we're going to do is we're, I'm going to tie this all up in, in one case for you, okay? And the, obviously the less is due process, equal protection. You, you have a right to know what's going on. You have a right to a meaningful participation in, in your case. Georgia Constitution, same thing, right to due process. Um, same right to benefit from counsel, assisting your defense. So there's two different ways right now. We have the Georgia Constitution, we have the U.S. Constitution that backs us up in using interpreters. Uh, okay, so budget. We were, we were talking about budget, and they were talking about how they're putting fear about masking and how not to mask because our federal funds will be taken away. Under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, as far as national origin, we cannot discriminate. So you need an interpreter. Why? This act. And I'm going to tie it all up in one case for you. But believe it or not, your funds can be taken away. So is a county fund? I think someone said, no, are your local funds going to be taken away? No. What's going to happen is since we're all federally funded as a collective, uh, if we're not providing interpreters or we don't have meaningful access to interpreters through the rules, through, through qualifications, through certification, all our money is going to be taken away. What, what was the, there was a clerk that oh, came up someone talked, came right? up to us at the last presentation and said that, that it, her, what she's been taught is that if the court doesn't provide interpreters and then the court is found to have violated this, um, the Civil Rights Act, that it's road money. It's school money. It's you know, all, it's the entire budget for that entire area, um, which is new to me. But she was the budget person, so I took her word for it. So, so back, I think uh, back in 2010, maybe maybe just a little bit before, North Carolina was uh, sent a letter by Department of Justice saying you're not providing interpreters, you're not providing meaningful access to the courts. We're going to take your money away. So they will send that letter out, and they will threaten, and they will say, hey. If you're not doing what you're supposed to, you're not going to be affected technically, it's the whole state's going to be affected. Okay, so as far as sign language interpreters go, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, is what's going to govern providing interpreters. This is, courts are a public accommodation, and honestly, most people that interact with the courts are do so by, they are compelled to do so. They don't just want to come in and say, oh, I want to go to court today and see what's going on. You know, so it's even worse because if, when uh, deaf people go to, do, the do what? The microphone. They're having problems. Oh, you can't hear me? There are, but they're too loud. All right, yeah. Just speak into it. You can hold it. Oh, is that better? Okay, so um, the ADA is going to require that courts provide interpreters because courts are a public, or they're a public point of access. So you have to provide interpreters in order to provide a reasonable accommodations. Now, under the ADA, the provider still gets to determine what a reasonable accommodation is. So when a deaf person goes to a doctor's office, or a deaf person goes to um, you know, a lawyer's office, and that person goes to the court, the provider gets to determine what a reasonable accommodation is, if that's writing, if that's pamphlets, pamphlets, if that's providing an interpreter. We're going to talk about a case that kind of clarifies that a little bit. The problem with this is, is that even though the ADA says the provider determines what the reasonable accommodation is, if you don't pick the right accommodation, you're going to be in trouble for it. If you say, no, we're okay, we're going to write back and forth, and then the deaf person doesn't understand it because English and American Sign Language aren't the same language, they're going to have a problem. And if their rights were taken away based on that decision, that problem is going to come back to the court. Um, so the ADA says you have to provide reasonable accommodation. We suggest, and there's a case that we'll talk about, we suggest that you defer to that person and ask them what they consider the reasonable accommodation to be. And if they say they need an interpreter, provide an interpreter. 
So basically, in, in federal law as well, uh, there's a court interpreters act that uh, requires interpreters to be used in judicial proceedings. What if they say it's okay to use it for, for my son to interpret for me? Who, who says that? The defendant. So he says my son can interpret for me. That's okay. That's a good question. Who's the judge? <laughs> Nah, just these two straight up people. Well, so now I'm saying you're the judge, right? Okay, yeah. All right, so um, Paul's here with me, brother Paul here. He says he's going to interpret for me. Um, do you know what kind of education he's had? Do you know what kind of experience he's had? Do you know, do you speak the same language? Are you able to tell whether or not he's actually interpreting well for me? So you as a, as a judge, is it too loud? If I just tell me. If I get closer, it's going to be louder. How about I just turn mine off? I'll speak a little louder, and if it can go through here, can everybody hear me? Yeah. We'll stay real close. So, so there's other things that you have to look at. I mean, you know, interpreters sound really good, and this is what we get in courts all the time. Oh, I have a really great interpreter, but when someone who sits in and listens, who speaks the same language, they kind of figure out that the interpreter is maybe not that good. So if you're dealing with someone who's a brother or a family member, that's the same thing, but, but there are other avenues that you can use. Thanks, Lord. There's other avenues you can use to figure that out, but we're going to get to that, the answer to that question. It's actually contained in your rules. There, is that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can use yours. Okay. Is that better now? That's better. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. This you. Okay, so there's also some state law that they talk about on the binding interpreter, and this is the one that I actually find that a lot of people don't know that they should. When it comes to deaf individuals, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, um, terminology is important. Uh, deaf, hard of hearing, hearing impaired. Typically, I think a lot of people think hearing impaired sounds the most politically correct and the nicest. Hearing impaired is kind of okay when you're talking about my grandmother, who, uh, before she passed away, is in her late hearing person just couldn't hear anymore. Hearing impaired or hard of hearing. If somebody comes into your courtroom and they use sign language to communicate, they are culturally deaf and deaf is the word that they will usually prefer. Hard of hearing, most of the time you're not going to offend anybody with that, so if you kind of want to go with that, it's just a general blanket until you find out. But if somebody comes in and they use sign language to communicate, deaf is going to most likely be their preferred term uh, for their culture. We'll see in the statute if they say hearing impaired still applies. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that with deaf people, if they are provided an interpreter for the proceedings and they are also provided with a court-appointed attorney, then the court is responsible to provide them with an interpreter at every meeting with their lawyer. If that lawyer is a public defender and everybody wants to argue, you all privately want to argue about whose budget that should come out of as the public defender's office or the courts, you can, but ultimately, the law says the court is responsible to do that. If the public defender goes to the jail to meet that client, the court's got to make sure that they have an interpreter there for that meeting. Any questions? And, okay. What about, does, the, does there have to be physical presence of the interpreter? So we, we'll talk about some, some other ways to provide interpreters via video relay. Interpreters via video relay can be a great tool and it certainly helps save money. When it comes to sign language interpreters, the thing you want to be conscious of, because it can apply to different settings, all of the participants, all of the stakeholders, what is their level of technology access? If you have a deaf person out in rural Georgia and you want to have a Zoom hearing and you have an interpreter via Zoom and they're in their home via Zoom but they don't have high-speed internet access, that's not going to work very well. Okay, on the phone, we can have a conversation. You know, we've all been there on our cell phones, and it broke up a little bit. We use interpreters that work for this closure skills. We all do it. You heard like 80% of the message, but you figured out that missing part based on the context of everything. That's actually really easy to do. Not so easy to do when you're video freezing. Because even though it might be one word, that sign on the video freezing could be a lot of other things. Um, so you want to take that into consideration. If they're going to the jail, if, and there it is. Make sure this is all on recording. I know they've got to be doing this too. It's earphone. Yeah. 
This is a test of emergency broadcast. <laughs> So, so, Paul, this is why we're here. Is this like an info? No, no, no. What, what, so what? Paul. If you're deaf, how do you get this? Oh, uh, it's going to be a lot of text. Yeah, okay, it's, a, it's a visual text message. My watch vibrated to let me know that what was going on. My phone would vibrate. Yeah, I mean, technology is amazing. Honestly, there's so many things. The hearing person is a commercial for some amazing technology. For, this is for sidetrack because it's still going on. Um, I see an amazing thing like a doorbell that makes your lights flash. My deaf people have been doing that for like 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, even Apple. I love that Apple. But even Apple recently came uh, up with their um, their uh, their uh, accessibility mode, so that you can actually like just. Um, you can touch your head and your thumb to answer your watch. I'm like, yeah, that's been an accessibility mode feature for like three years. That's not a new feature. It's, you're just telling everybody about it. Let me follow up. When we were on the COVID-19 task force, uh, Paul and I also worked on, on those rules as well. We, we, were, we had to deal with uh, a mask. The person using a mask and, and doing sign language and doing it by video. And we determined basically that you, it's hard to do. I mean, so, so American Sign Language is not just what's on your hands. It's, it's what's on your hands, it's where your hands are in space. So for example, like some, God, this isn't a sign language class, but this is father and this is grandfather because they are older and how to uh, Like it's, it's where it is visually, but it's also facial expressions. The difference of emphasis, like we say, oh, like you put emphasis on the voice, that emphasis is on your face in American Sign Language. So two signs could be exactly the same, and a different facial expression will change the meaning between sarcasm, emphasis, or just kind of a neutral tone. So when you wear a mask, you lose that. Sign language interpreters adapted, deaf people adapted, and that's when you saw all those clear face coverings. So they were wearing a mask for protection, but it was a clear covering so that the deaf people would so, so the situation with him, if you had a video, and the question is, uh, who shot him? We know the father did, right? And then the video skips and he's already doing this. <laughs> he's <laughs> the grandfather him. shot him, right? Grandfather shot him. Um, or, yeah, yeah. If it was, if it was uh, the grandfather that shot him, but it stopped here and then the video stopped, right? And yeah. then we get that second part. Yeah. Okay. So this just goes into that and is clarifying the definitions. It's not just court, okay? It's not just court, it's any proceeding which has a wide-ranging definition, and it's any agency which has a wide-ranging definition. And in fact, there's a federal court case that um, basically just wrapped up uh, that was against the state of Georgia probation and parole department for not providing interpreters during, during an intake for probation, right? And the case was basically about people who were getting, uh, were, were being cited for uh, probation violations, never had an interpreter. How do they know what the rules are? How do you tell somebody you have to do this, 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 and this without having an interpreter? They don't understand the rules, and then you violate their probation and they don't do the thing that they never even knew they were supposed to do. How, how many of you have probation officers to say uh, uh, to the defendant, you have to bring in somebody who speaks English to your first appointment? If you don't do that, you may be violated. How many have heard that? I, I've heard that many times. You can't do that. In, in that case, I was actually, even though I'm an attorney, I still do certain jobs as an interpreter. And in that case, I was, I was one of the interpreters, and it created a very difficult situation where someone had filmed a sheriff trying to interpret it, and they asked us, the court interpreters, to interpret what they were saying. I have no idea what they were saying. I, 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 in, <laughs> un, unintelligible. <laughs> no idea what they were even guessing at. Uh, this also applies to witnesses and to parents in the individual even if the parents are deaf, but the individual who's coming before your court is, is a juvenile. Um, so if, the, if, if it's juvenile court, the parents will get an interpreter, even though they're not the person that's technically their interpreter. Okay, so the Supreme Court is the one that's established through this, this uh, code section to establish the Standing Judicial Commission on Court Interpreters. So they're the ones that uh, basically get the committee together, they're the ones that, that appoint people. Um, right now, there, I think there's 10 committee members made, made up from each class of court plus an attorney. And then there's other advisory uh, people like, like Paul himself that, that help 
you know, get these rules in place. So uh, there's there's several things that we're working on right now. One of them, hopefully, is that it's a centralized location for interpreters to, so the court can call and have someone uh, that's qualified immediately. I mean, I've been pushing for that. I think everybody knows what language line is. Yeah. Think about a Georgia language. Georgia courts direct language. Yeah, someone you know that's qualified. And as Paul likes to say, we've done the heavy lifting for you, so we know that this person's qualified and certified and, and meets all the criteria. Yeah. Um, what happens when you have a person who doesn't speak a language that you're the interpreter? I have this happen. We will get it, yes. Oh, okay. Do you mind if we hold that? Because that is a whole, yeah, that's a whole topic. That is a great question. All right, so I told you I'd tie it all in for you, and, and basically, uh, I'm going to read from my notes here on this one, but basically the Lane case is the case that ties everything that I've told you about all the laws and statutes that ties all this in together. Uh, just basically about Miss, Miss Lane, she was convicted of cruelty to children in the first degree. She spoke Mandarin Chinese. The attorney, what, what he was doing is when they, they all met prior to trial, and what they did is they got uh, the husband to interpret for her and they had a whole bunch of people around and they, and they tried to give her a plea offer. What they did was they used the husband to give the plea offer uh, and the attorney himself did not get a qualified interpreter to interpret. So Judge Still, we had a, Judge Still? <laughs> it's okay, Judge Still. Yes. So in this case, they used the husband as the interpreter in the Lane case. So, so he wasn't qualified. And so what the Supreme Court said, the question was whether the trial court found as a matter of fact that the defense spoke and understood English well enough to understand the nature and object of the proceedings against her, to consult with her counsel, and to assist in preparing for the defense. So all those things I told you about the 5th, the, 6th, the, uh, and 14th Amendment, all these things tie in right now as far as due process. The other question they asked was, was she competent? In other words, was she denied the right to be present and did she receive effective assistance of counsel due to the, uh, with, with a, an interpreter that wasn't uh, properly qualified? So if you look at the, on, on our materials, I've included the Lane case for you. Okay, so what did they determine? They determined that one who is unable to communicate effectively in English and does not receive an interpreter's assistance is no more competent to proceed than an individual who's incompetent due to mental incapacity. Okay, so, so think about that. We, we use the brother in this case to interpret in your court proceeding. It's basically like having a mentally incompetent person in court. Okay, so we can use, you can, you can take the chance and use an interpreter that you think may be qualified. Look, you know, so-and-so works uh, we know he speaks Spanish or she speaks Spanish. We're, even though they're not on the registry, we're just going to take a chance. But you're basically dealing with someone who's incompetent, mentally incompetent, to, to uh, uh, assist in the proceedings. Also, this is written by Ju uh, Justice Melton in this opinion. To the remind, remind the bench, as a recipient of federal funding, the court system is obligated to provide persons who are limited English proficient with meaningful access to the courts. You must comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Omnibus uh, Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. Otherwise, you can lose federal funding. And this is in the Lane case. So all those things I talked to you about as far as the amendments and uh, the statutes that apply, this brings it all together. This is the emergency broadcasting system. Well, it's Carol Hunstein saying, I wrote the damn thing. <laughs> yes. Um, no, go ahead. Okay, uh, so still a uh, Lee Baptiste Health case. It's not a Georgia case, it's a federal case. Um, and it's Florida, and it's related to health care. But it's, it's here for persuasive authority. Um, this case was about the thing I mentioned earlier about deferring to the deaf individual, or honestly, the limited English proficient individual, that's what you call a person who doesn't. 
deferring to them for what they need to interact with the court. Um, in this case, the, the uh, hospital tried to provide video interpreters, and there are times when that doesn't work. I, I've been an interpreter in an emergency room that literally had to climb up a wall because you've all seen ER, right? Person's on the bed, they've got healthcare professionals hovered over them, but they're asking them questions. I kind of need to be over the top of it. But, um, if you've just got a little TV, remember that was like our favorite part of school, you roll that TV in on the cart. Uh, you roll that TV out into that emergency room, and I'm just like there, hey doc, can you move out of the way? That's not gonna happen, that's not gonna happen. Um, the deaf person asked for a live in-person interpreter, they refused, the signal was bad, um, it was choppy, the interpreter wasn't qualified, there were tons of problems with it, and this case basically said, defer to the individual the interpreter for what access they need. Okay. So, again, we go back. Georgia courts must make a diligent effort to first seek licensed interpreters before qualifying non-licensed interpreters. And I know that almost answers your question about people who might not be on it, but we have an entire section. We just threw it in here because it's a, it's a foreshadow for the good stuff. We're, we're setting it up. We're setting it up for the good stuff. So these are all the local rules. Our, our, our local, our, our municipal court rule is 14. Magistrate does the same number. Superior court 7.3. State court uses 7.3, and the probate court rule is 10.2. All right. So why do we need an interpreter? That was better. That was way better than yeah. the last one. I appreciate it. that. Was pretty good. All right. So now we'll talk about the stuff that sparks a lot more questions. How to get an interpreter. Or realistically, it's how to get the right interpreter. Okay? Because to answer your question, to answer your question, to answer a lot of questions, every interpreter is not the right interpreter. Right? We can only say, oh, well, it's the brother. And, and these are great questions. Who are they really? Like, what qualifications do they have really? What if it was my sibling? I'm one of 10 court interpreters in the entire city. I'm certainly qualified professionally to do it, but I'm really not because there's a very clear conflict. That is the other thing that you have to think about. It's, it, there's a lot of questions we're going to get to, but the right interpreter is the skill, education, experience, background, any perceived or actual conflicts of interest. So first thing you have to do is determine what language you need. That is actually not as easy uh, as it may seem. Deaf people, it seems pretty easy, right? So if somebody comes into the court, goes to the setting, goes to the clerk, goes up to the you know, wherever they're going to come, goes like this, and, you know, gesture that they don't, that they don't hear you. We think they need an American sign interpreter, right? Who would say yes? Okay, who would say no? Who feels I'm tricking them and does not want to answer? <laughs> that would be the right answer. <laughs> um, there are just as many sign language variations as there are spoken. American sign language is what we speak here, different than French sign language, Spanish sign language, Polish sign language. Those will be far more difficult, and you can call the EOC, you can call the EOC, and we'll try and figure it out, but I have had a case when I lived in Pennsylvania, when an individual came into the court and needed Polish sign language, and it was an ordeal to get them an interpreter. Luckily, most of the time, it will be American Sign Language, but it's not as easy, and that one's going to be hard. You're going to get an American Sign Language interpreter, the American Sign Language interpreter is going to come to the court, and they will help you figure out what language you need. Now, there's also like homemade inter uh, sign language yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Um, well, we can talk about that real quick. So there's also something that's what are called home signs. Um, so real quick kind of lesson, if you think about where language comes from, right? A group of people, they see something, they make a sound, and they all agree that sound means that thing. Right? Little bit happens. Okay, people see fire, they'll make a sound, they kind of communicate this sound, and there's fire out of the woods. That's how we come up with language. It's an agreed upon mode of communicating. If someone, even if they live in a community, if they are isolated from that group of people who are making those decisions, they won't make the same decisions. Deaf people who live in rural areas or have been oppressed, not given access to education, they don't, they might not know American Sign Language or any sign language. They may only know home signs, the signs that they and their family created to be able to survive and understand each other. In those cases, you will need a specialized interpreter to, to kind of deal with that. And depending on the level, that person might have a hard time going through trial regardless. 
Um, so know the qualifications of the interpreter present and needed. So, okay, you know what language you need, and we'll get into the, the explanation of how. You know what language you need, then you need to know, is this person the right fit for that language? What are their qualifications? Know which court appearances require interpreters. Anybody? Which court appearances require interpreters? Oh, that's a trick. Okay, not all of them. There might be a couple that don't. We'll, we'll get into that. All right, be aware of who should not be interpreting in any situation. Please make this joke. It will hurt me. It cannot be your father, or your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. Spaceballs. All right. See, it was as bad as my joke. As bad as my dad. All right. Go watch Spaceballs. It's a fun movie. So be aware of who should not be interpreting. And those are going to be related to conflicts. But those conflicts might not actually be familial conflicts. If I'm an interpreter that is an interpreter for counsel, meaning I met with the attorney and the client and I interpreted for that, and now we're having a trial, I can't be the court interpreter. If I'm interpreting between a plaintiff and their attorney, but they're suing a defendant who also is deaf and needs an interpreter, I can't be the interpreter between the defendant and their attorney. Interpreters who work with the client and the attorney become agents of the attorney. So they would have the same conflicts that the attorney would have. An attorney can't be like, I'm going to quit and now I'll be the mediator. Let me, let me bring one up. So, Go ahead. So we have to have two interpreters in court. Yes, maybe. I mean, I've actually been involved in cases where we've had eight. We'll get into that in a number, but that's a great question. So, so you heard about the clerks being in the, in the police, uh, having their office in the police station, right? The court clerks. What about a court clerk uh, interpreting? Is that, is that good? Why? Those are things we're going to discuss. How many interpreters are needed? Sometimes it's one. And, and I will tell you that there is a very large area where we can discuss where we save money by having one interpreter, and there's a huge area that we do not have to, you know, have an army of interpreters to come out for. But sometimes you might and have the resources to get the right interpreter on hand. We have the resources in the room. Uh, but having the resources to get the interpreter will give you some resources to where you can go to find these interpreter. And even though it's not necessarily related to getting the right interpreter, it is important to know who pays for the interpreter. All right, so determining what language is needed, uh, self-identification, representation. Deaf person comes in, points to their ear, gestures, they can't hear you. Best thing to do is get an American Sign Language interpreter and we'll find out what language it is coming in pulling out. Uh, familiar identification. Most people who need interpreters, if they can, if they have a brother, sister, uncle, nephews, former women, they will bring that person in, if that person speaks English, to communicate with the court to say, hey, this person needs this, this language interpreter. And visual identification, which could be this. All right, so if everybody looks in their materials, we've provided a, this list right here. So if someone walks into your court, and they speak Albanian. Anybody speak Albanian here? No, right? So how are you gonna ask? How do you know what language? So what we do is we have this chart and there's, we've got one in there, I think it's got 99? It's got 99. So they're able to point to what language they speak and they're able to tell. Every language says, point to your language and we'll give you an interpreter. We, we don't have to know what it says. That's how I'm telling you what it says. Every single one literally tells them that you spot one that they can understand, and then they point to the one that they understand, and then in the English above it, it tells you what language to get. What does it say It's a really good question. Good question. No, we, it's a really good question. Familial, remember, you can also have family tell you what language they speak. They can, sometimes they can tell you. Sometimes they can. It's just going through for you, tells you what it says, point your language, the interpreter will call, and that the interpreter is provided in the call. Who's here from anybody from Smyrna? If anybody goes to Smyrna, don't they have they have that, that the same thing in your court? Yeah. When you go when you check in, they've got this posted on their on their walls. Uh, one of the great things I've seen uh, you guys do. So thank you. So now we're gonna talk about the qualifications. This is what uh, Judge Walker referred to a second ago that I'd like to say that we did the heavy lifting for you. Um, in fact, we did so much heavy lifting for you that there's not really even a lot of need for you to know all that goes into it. But basically what we did was we created a list and categorized that list of licensed interpreters. There are master interpreters, there are legal interpreters, there are 
provision with licensed interpreters. There are two others which aren't actually allowed to work, but we'll talk about that in a second. We'll one time it is, but we'll talk about that in a second. But what we determine what qualifications those people need in order to get those levels. So, and then we also give you a nice handy dandy chart. Everybody gets that? Handy dandy chart to show what court cases are most appropriate for which level of interpreter. So that you know what court case you have, you know what interpreter you've got, and the interpreters are coming, going to come in with nice fancy ID badges with QR codes that you can scan to confirm that they actually are on the list and that they are still active on the list and what their level is. And you can say, yep, this court case is this kind of interpreter, and you are that kind of interpreter. Did all the heavy lifting for you. Does anybody know how you actually would want to hear a random interpreter to just hand in? Does anybody have that in their head already? That's why we did the heavy lifting for you. <laughs> but we're going to get to your question, what if they're not on the list because it's a rare question, or it's a, it's a rare language. This is just some of the stuff that they're required to do, okay? They do have to go to an interpreter orientation because being an interpreter is a lot more than just knowing two languages. It's, it's way more than just knowing two languages. There are incredible ethical decisions that have to be made at every single point that you're interpreting. I remember when I was interpreting in Florida and in a federal court, um, the judge um, was fluent in Spanish, told the jury that he was fluent in Spanish, told the jury that he has had numerous, uncountable cases with Spanish interpreters, and told the jury that in all of his cases, Spanish is his first language, fluent Spanish, he has only corrected the interpreter twice and was wrong both times. I don't know if that's true, but it's a great thing to tell the jury anyway, um, because it, it does solidify the point that there is a difference when you interpret versus knowing the language. So we do all this stuff, orientation so they understand how to behave in court. Um, one thing I will tell you that, that I tell everybody, it's super easy, you don't have to know a language to know that when you speak English, the interpreter speaks another language. So I have to know say, I move my hands. And then the deaf person moves their hands. And then I move my hands. And then I say something in English. That's interpreting. If you say something in English, and I move my hands, the deaf person moves my hand, their hands, and then I move my hands again, and they move their hands again, we're talking. We're having a conversation. That doesn't mean that that's wrong, because I might need to clarify something. But you should instantly know that that interpreter doesn't know what they're doing because before I move my hands a second time, I need to let the judge know. I shouldn't be doing that all on my own without keeping the court informed about what's going on. And yeah, on the spoken language part, again, if you have the same thing, you have this interaction going back and forth, they're not doing their job. A, a good interpreter clarifies what they're saying, what they're clarifying, say, I have to clarify what I just told them, they just asked me this question. Remember, it's the person here is like a telephone. So it's just the receiver, and it just goes in, input, output. With the two other categories are apprentice and ad hoc. So apprentice is an important person to have on this list because I think everybody will agree, we don't have enough interpreters. We could always use more interpreters, especially good, qualified, certified, master, licensed level interpreters, and we cannot have too many of them. An apprentice is somebody that can be allowed into the court because they've done the background check, they've gone to orientation, but they are not permitted to work on their own, but they can go with a licensed interpreter so that they can learn. That's super beneficial for court cases that might not be open to the public. So somebody can come in and say, no, no, I'm not just some person on the street. I have done the orientation, I have a little ID badge, I'm an apprentice, I've got a background check. I'm here for a reason rather than just, oh, everybody come in who wants to learn sign language and how to be an interpreter in court. Uh, obviously, open court, we don't really, that's you know, less of an issue. Ad you want to go ad hoc? Okay. Yeah. So, ad hoc and interpreter is Judge uh, Stills' brother, right? The guy who's interpreting. Anybody that's not on the court registry, anybody that's not signed up, that is an ad hoc interpreter. They haven't taken the test, they're not registered, uh, they're not qualified. Should we? Do the rules on right now? Well, we can do that now. So, so the only reason we use them is to answer your question. Rare language. Somebody comes into your courtroom and speaks Spanish, and then someone else comes up and says, Oh, I know Spanish. Are you on the list? No. Oh, it's fine. We'll use you as an ad hoc interpreter. We have plenty of Spanish interpreters. That is not necessary. But there are languages 
that we might not have on the list. And in those cases, you may have to voir dire, and we'll help you out with that. You may have to voir dire that interpreter, help that interpreter understand what their responsibilities are, and you may have to approve that interpreter on an ad hoc basis. The biggest thing that we did for this, for, for this, with the ad hoc um, label, is that we asked the courts to help us. Because somebody shows up to your court once as an ad hoc interpreter for that language, but then goes to, I mean, we have a lot of counties, and <laughs> we have a lot of courts. We have a lot of goes to time. every other county and starts interpreting. They interpret 500 times in a year, but they're an ad hoc, and nobody knows. If you're interpreting 500 times, that's not rare anymore. Really. Right? And you don't need to be an ad hoc interpreter. And in fact, we've established five times is not rare. So if someone comes into your court and is a rare language, you contacted um, the administrator's office of the courts to get help. There's nobody that we have. They help you. You have somebody in the community who you want to hear and allow them to interpret in your court. Call the AOC and say, here's this person's name. Here's what we have on them. Because they can say, oh, we know them. They've interpreted three times before. Thank you. Check mark number four. Fifth time, we reach out. But honestly, we reach out the fifth time to say, go to orientation and pay your dues. The very first time, we reach out and say, hey, let's do a background check. This could happen again. Mm -hmm. Most court cases are not one and done anyway. So you've got that rare language in there for that first arraignment or that first court appearance. They might have to be back anyway. Reach out to the AOC for help, and the AOC can help get them some of the basic stuff we need to do. The thing I always bring up with this, and this is crazy, we've all heard these stories about American Sign Language interpreters who don't even know sign language on TV. We, there was the one standing right next to President Obama, like literally right next to him, and it's like they did not know sign language. The, the background checks for even like being in the same grocery store are crazy, but apparently if you need an interpreter, no background checks required. Sure, come on on stage, right? See them next to the police officers during national emergencies. One, I think the most recent one I saw, was a woman, there, there was like a manhunt for someone, and she was interpreting sign language, didn't know sign language, and she had like three warrants herself. And that's so pretty, that's, that's, that's brazen. That's, that's pretty brazen. Are you talking about me? Oh no, someone else, okay, I keep doing um, it. What we're trying to avoid, um, we're trying to avoid, and for those of you who have had uh, Spanish-speaking defendants, where they bring their own interpreter, we're trying to avoid people who are uh, un unlawful licensed uh, practice of law, UPL. So what we had was, we had these people called notarios in the Spanish community that told people that they were notaries, which they interpreted as being attorneys. And what they were doing is they were showing up to court, getting paid, as an attorney, but then say, hey, I'm here, and she's paid me as a private interpreter. So what we're trying to do is avoid things like that, because if you have this ad hoc person, how are we gonna keep track of them? How do we know that they're, they're around? It's up to you. Informing the uh, administrative office of the courts, getting this person registered so that we know that they're not hopping around, you know, either practicing law without a license, or actually, you know, just, just basically defrauding people. So, so it's five times total, not five different cases. No. Five times total. Five times total. Five cases. So five appearances even in the same case. Yes. Now, now the appearance is, is a little interesting, right? Let's say somebody appears for a two-day thing, right? Well, well, I'm thinking. Like a raiment or. I'm thinking a bond, maybe, a raiment, maybe. Yes. Different, different. I mean, yep. Yes. Yeah, and this is the situation I had, that the person spoke up. Mexican dialect, it sounded Spanish, so they had a Spanish interpreter, but it, the Spanish interpreter was like, no. East LA or what was it? <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. It was, it was, it was so, so we, so I guess the five times, it's, it's five times, even if it's in that same. Yes. And this is why calling the EOC is going to be super important, because there's space between the first and the second time. The real thing we're doing here is just making sure that we don't have, because it could be somebody's brother, and they don't even tell you. Right? Because if you think about it, the defendant doesn't speak English, the interpreter does, and the interpreter's like, oh, well, I know that, I know this language, but I don't know them, or whatever. Like, we don't know. And in fact, in our last presentation uh, with the counsel of the clerk, someone came up to us, an interpreter who. Is that Merrick? Merrick or something like that? No, no, I think it was Spanish. I mean, I don't know. Whatever, whatever the language was, they came up and they said, uh, this interpreter is somebody we use all the time, they've been here a lot. And he just found out that they were their brother. 
They were related, yeah. That they were related, and nobody ever told us. In fact, the only way we found out was because the interpreter knew about the next court date, got upset that the court didn't call them fast enough and called the court. Like, why haven't you called me? And my brother told me, no. <laughs> um, and then obviously it is his brother. And, and Rick Reisick, uh, Rockdale County, they used to use the deputy, right, to interpret. They did. Yeah, they would use the, in, the deputies to interpret for defendants during a plea colloquy, during sentencing. Yeah, so. <laughs> Ad so, hoc interpretation. Uh, we do have to ask another little bit. Uh, okay. So, which proceedings require interpreters? You said all of them, obviously, all of them. And it is all of them, unless there are exceptions. Uh, those exceptions are the individual waives their right to use an interpreter. Okay? Um, they may have limited English proficiency, but if they're just pleading guilty to a speeding ticket and they, they understand enough English to do that and are willing to waive that right, then that's up to them. They can waive that right to do that. And it's got to be in writing, by the way. <laughs> Such a waiver shall be in writing and approved by the decision maker. So as a judge, you make around. that decision, you get to evaluate, yeah, when I'm sitting here talking to this person in English, they may not understand legalese. If we're going to have a trial for a major felony, maybe we need to, and we're going to have expert witnesses, maybe we need to have an interpreter, but they are pleading guilty to going 10 miles away to speed them and I'm talking to them, I think that's okay. The decision maker determines on the record that the right to the interpreter has been waived, knowing to be voluntarily, and the person has been um, assisted in the service most available. Let me go to that last. See where it says on the bottom on number three, it says additionally counsel, go back. It says, additionally, counsel may waive the presence of an interpreter in bond hearings. That language is being taken out right now. Okay, so there's no exception there. It's going to be taken out, uh, but right now it's in the rules, but I expect we'll probably within the next week or two. Just to clarify, it can be waived in writing. Right. The I mean, problem is, is it says it must be waived in writing, and then it says this sentence, counsel may, counsel may waive it, and there's confusion. Does that mean counsel can waive the bond hearing or, not in writing? Right. So it's going to be taken out, and it will still apply to bond hearing. But it will apply to the hearings the same way it applies to everything else. Must be done in the right way, the decision maker must evaluate. Right. Uh, the application of similar requirements um, for debt card hearing uh, is codified in 24.6.655. Failure to request an interpreter is not a waiver. We will talk about, there are rules that talk about when they have to let you know they need an interpreter. If they let you know they need these are decisions and it may impact how you schedule or how, you know, how payment is made, but failing to ask for an interpreter itself is not a waiver. This is an example of the chart that we're going to give you where it says, hey, this is the type of court case, this is the court, this is the type of court case, this is the type of proceeding, these are the interpreters that can do that job. All right, let me, let me go on this one. Yep. So, I think it's, is it the next slide on municipal courts? So if you look at this, uh, there's some court hearings there that you can use a conditionally licensed interpreter depending on if it's a trial or not. For all criminal trials, including magistrate and municipal, is it on the next one? Or? It's not. It's not. There's language in there saying a conditional, uh, conditionally qualified interpreter can be used for a trial, but it's not. We're gonna, we've taken out that language. Again, that's going to be changed. It was, it was just considered by all of us, and, and you know, if you're if you're dealing with someone's rights, and you're dealing with a trial, something as important as a trial, a conditionally qualified interpreter should not be available. So, where it's it's going to be limited to master, and just a licensed interpreter. This, this is what it comes down to: don't have enough interpreters, and we are all very conscious not to create rules that make it harder to get interpreters in the future. But we have to balance that with. A warm body is better than no body. Sometimes no body is better than a warm body because when you have no body, you reschedule. When you have no body, you figure out a way to get a body. And sometimes that warm body just skips the process. We got it. That's what I was going to get at because the other day we had a Turkish speaking individual and he was We will have a Turkish interpreter here your case will be reset. So that's a great that's a great point. Did everybody hear that? There's a Turkish interpreter couldn't get an, couldn't find an interpreter, couldn't get an interpreter on language line, use Google Translate or some app to let them know that we are rescheduling. 
you have to ask yourself, what is the risk here, right? To let them know what rescheduling is fine. To have the trial, not, not fine. fine. Right, like, you just, what, are, what is at stake here? Um, yeah, one, one thing I always go back to is the Ling case. Even if you have an interpreter that's just not good, remember, you have a mentally incompetent person. It's like having no one there. Okay? You, you've got to go back to that Ling case every single time. Go ahead. Person not to be used an interpreter. Nice long list. Any questions about who's on that list, who's not on that list? But it says recommend. So. <laughs> Ad hoc? <laughs> yeah, so. It's not lazy. So. You have to ask yourself, what's going on? Here's the point. If you are just using a family member to tell them that you're going to reschedule their date and let them know that you're going to have an interpreter, that's OK. You have to ask yourself, what are the, what are the stakes here? What's going to happen? Hypothetically speaking, if, if you have, um, let's go with the a person with a conflict, either ethically or procedural 5.3, or 5, 5.3. So I'm going to turn. If I show up to a speeding ticket with my client, and my client's deaf, and the court did not provide an interpreter, I cannot be my client's interpreter. That, that's unethical. I can't be their interpreter, interpret what everything's saying, and still actually be an attorney and object to things that are happening. But if my client's going to plead guilty to the speeding ticket, and we've talked about it, it I, like, I, can, I can assert to the court that my client's pleading guilty. I would actually probably just say, can, we, can I enter a plea of extension and ask my client to go down the hall, a plea for them, and then I'll go up and tell them that happened because they weren't there. Um, but you have to evaluate what is going on. Judge. Yeah, I have three questions. One, your written waiver. What language is the written waiver of the interpreter supposed to be in? Second, your last one there, when they have a conflict, you mentioned that if the interpreter has interpreted between the lawyer and the defendant client, <clears throat> that they should then be precluded from interpreting as the court interpreter. Yes. So if the attorney shows up with a Spanish-speaking client and uses our court interpreter, does that disqualify that interpreter from further proceedings with the, as the court interpreter? Okay, because that's a great one, and that's why it's recommended. That's the one where I tell interpreters, because I, because I tell interpreters, sometimes interpreters forget about that conflict. If you are what's called the proceedings interpreter, you are there for the court, you can't interpret that privilege communication. And there's a conflict if you do, but there is no need to waste the court's money, everyone's time, if you are there for a speeding ticket, and the guy is going to plead guilty, I'm the proceedings interpreter, what's the risk? Is there any conflict? He's admitted, and it's admitted to a factual basis for all of the claims. There's, is, there a, is there a conflict in he can his attorney talk, they send him to the guilty, I come out and I say, he's pleading guilty. Now, if he changes his mind and he's not guilty, now I'm out, because I interpreted that privilege of communication, so I can't be here for the court anymore. But if all I'm doing is communicating, what is open to everybody, they're, they're admitting to a factual basis, they're pleading guilty to the, to the actual claims, there's, there's very little risk of a conflict, different than if I interpreted some privileged communication where we talked about where people were and what they were doing, and now I'm going to go interpret for witnesses during a trial. As far as the writing itself, so <laughs> I know you were looking at that one. So, so think about it. The only, do, the only reason you're going to do a written waiver is if the person speaks enough English, all right? So I guess it has to be in, in, their, in the English language. But you as the gatekeeper, you're going to make sure and you're going to vet that person, make sure they understand that, make sure that they understand that by giving up all those rights, you know, they're, they're going at their own peril. But you can decide at that moment and say, hey, look, I don't care if you're signing a written waiver. I'm not going to do it. I don't think I don't think it's valid. I don't think you speak enough English. Uh, you know, based based upon what I, the information I have, we need an interpreter. So it's really up to you. I don't need an interpreter. I'm going to sign a written waiver, but I don't need a court interpreter. But I'm going to have my brother just help me for the things that I'm not too clear about. Yeah. that's needing an interpreter. That's that's and again, link case, link. Don't lose reasonability. Yes. Yes.
No, the, the fact that they're asking to bring someone that speaks the language, they're supposed to provide those language services. So anything ancillary to the court, they have to provide those uh, limited English proficiency they services. They the court, not they the defendant. Yes. Right, right, the court, I'm sorry, they the court. The court, the court has to provide, or whatever agency it is that works with the court, be it probation office, be it community service, whatever, whatever you sanction, they have to provide those limited uh, English proficiency services. I mean, services. it's an example that I think everybody needs to really set in. Defendant goes to probation and has to show up for probation, but probation is located on the second floor. There's an outside entrance, but there's no ramp. Probation says, bring your own ramp. Oh. Right? That would be, we all can understand how ridiculous that would be. Mm -hmm. It is the exact same thing, bring your own ramp. Judge. Um, you can speak the language like you said, your own language, and you advise your client basically you communicate. Or appoint an interpreter. The interpreter is not interpreting exactly basically. Oh, I'm okay. You object basically, right? At that time, and you tell the judge that the judge, the interpreter, is not competent to confess to the interpreter. So this is a court proceeding. It's a visual conflict. It's known to the client. Yes, so just to make sure I understand you, you're basically saying, so I include in sign language, or Judge Bob is speaking in Spanish, so I have a deaf client, but we don't need our interpreter, we can communicate directly, we're having a hearing, and that interpreter is making a lot of errors, I'm objecting to every single error, at some point I say, Judge, this is, this is, this is interpreter, this interpreter for this hearing, I can move for a continuance, get an interpreter. Yes? I've had cases where the interpreter, uh, we, we had a case, I had a cruelty to children charge, uh, and the interpretation was the child got hurt and then I took him to the hospital. The interpreter interpreted, I hurt the child and took him to the hospital. I understood, the interpreter that was interpreting for my client understood, there was an interpreter up there on the stand. No one else understood that she had made that mistake. So, lucky for me, I, I understood what was going on, but the interpreter actually piped up as well and, and objected. We, we ended up solving that issue, but the damage on that was, was astronomical. My, my guy would have been convicted. And that transitions right into, if I can translate, this is my next question, transit to the number of interpreters. So, I'm just gonna put them all up here and talk about them because we are running a little bit of time. Yeah. So, when determining the number of interpreters, okay, things to consider, length and complexity of the case. Sign language interpreters have been doing this right for a long time, so the language interpreters have been struggling to get traction on it, even though they wanted it. But there have been lots of studies, usually in the UN, because that's where most of the are, um, that show interpreting and the ability to be proficient and be accurate starts to go down at around 15, 20 minutes. That's why you have interpreters work in pairs and they will switch back and forth every 15 or 20 minutes. It's also a check and balance. So while one interpreter is actively working, the other interpreter is listening and, listening and analyzing in order to correct anything that needs to be corrected. Those interpreters, the proceedings interpreters, work as a team for the court. You may still need yet another interpreter because of a different role. So those interpreters are the proceedings interpreters. They are the court's interpreters. They are neutral. They, they speak for everyone in the court. Witnesses, the judges, the uh, judges. Judge, attorneys, anybody, somebody just yells out the court, they interpret everything. The interpreter that interprets between the any party, because it doesn't have to be a defendant, it can be a petitioner, whatever, uh, anybody who interprets between a party and their witness is called an interpreter for counsel. That person has a few roles. One is to interpret the privileged communication between the attorney and the, the party. They also have a role to monitor both proceedings interpreters in order to afford the, the, the attorney who doesn't speak the language the ability to object. So that interpreter is watching them so they can say to that attorney, you should probably object to that because that is objectionable. That's not what was said. The attorney objects and then we have a conversation. That interpreter will tell the judge what they think the witness actually said. The other interpreters will confer. Most of the time, especially, I'm hoping everybody on this list is professional enough, some people make mistakes. It is a very tough job. Sometimes interpreters say, I, I correct the record, 
this is what was said. Sometimes they stand by their interpretation, and there's a disagreement about what was said. The point is, is it's objected to, to preserve the objection, and then it can be clarified. Because if there is a misunderstanding, you can ask a clarifying question to get that point across. But that, that interpreter at the table also does that. Even though I'm fluent in sign language, I don't need an interpreter to interpret for me. If it's going to be a long trial, I may still hire an interpreter to watch them, because I can't watch them and ask my own questions on the rest. Just move forward. Yeah. There's another scenario. OK. Does that speak the language and the court appointing an attorney? I mean, I'm sorry, the court appointing an interpreter. The interpreter's not doing the job. The judge, basically what? Yes, absolutely. I will always say it is more than speaking the language. So I would always say that if someone just spoke a language, so I have fluent sign language, I am also a, a nationally certified interpreter. If I just spoke the language, I would want to confer before I make a huge deal because there are nuances to interpreting where the interpreter has to make a certain decision and has to say a certain thing because of these ethics or because like, it's, it's not just knowing the language and it's, it's really hard to say. But there are certain decisions that have to be made and it's worth discussing to understand why. If the interpreter accepts they made an error, great. But if you're talking about somebody who's just bad at their job, like, this isn't like ethics or whatever, they're just literally interpreting the wrong information, then yes, then you, you determine what I I speak this language, and they just said that their, their mother passed away two weeks ago, and you said that their grandson passed away two weeks ago. Those words don't even sound the same. Um, you know, but yes, but when you speak a language, sometimes there will be things where you, you might pause and question. I would have a conversation just to understand why I asked. LaShawn, yes. Well, let's go with this question, and then we have a question on the if the judge, so I said, I'm an interpreter, I see the interpreter is doing something wrong, I would object, and if we talk to the judge and determine that these interpreters are inappropriate, can we, can we set a continuance? Uh, judge asked, well, what if the judge themselves, sua sponte, says, I speak this language, and I know they're doing a bad job, should can I just go ahead and, and set a continuance? Absolutely. I would just say, just if it's a language thing, great. If it's, I always would want to confer with the interpreter first, because I have seen very complicated things happen um, where colloquial language and legalese or you know like there's there's a complication I just want to talk to the interpreter first and evaluate if it is a ethical decision they're making or if they're just a bad interpreter if they're a bad interpreter and reset the case. The reason I say this when I'm sitting as a master court judge in a family violence petition, the interpreter is basically trans not translating Communicate back and forth to try to explain. Yes, so yeah, yeah. You're yeah. not basically interpreting. Yeah. Right, right, right. Exactly. You shut it down? Yeah, you shut it down. And then there's the only thing where I really struggle with is the the, the because it's, it's, but yeah, if they're communicating back and forth, that's to me the, like, the biggest red flag. If an interpreter, if I don't understand something, because it might be a name. In sign language, we have name signs, right? So this, it's not a sign, I don't know what that is, that's a person's name. But I, it doesn't even mean Paul. This, this could be like any name because it represents the person. So I might have to clarify and say, hey, do you know their English name? Because you have to tell me their English name so that I can tell everybody. I don't do that until I say to the court, the interpreter needs to clarify a specific piece of information. Um, I usually don't even say what that is because also this could have been a, a mistake. It could be a city, right? I would say it's a person's name, it might be a city. The interpreter needs to clarify a piece of information. I'm good, thank you. I clarify that information and then I give my whole message that was supposed to be interpreted on. Like what piece of it needed to be clarified and like ethically we don't parse that out. I don't have a whole message, tell the court, but if they're going back and forth, that's a huge red right flag because they don't know like one of the basic rules. You don't have a conversation back and forth. Judge. Well I just had a question because I have a lot of folks that come to the court that use language and first language is not English. But they understand a lot more than they can speak. So, because they can answer questions, yes or no. So I, I have concerns whether yes or no is just they they think they're supposed to say yes because I'm asking the question, or do they really understand what I'm saying? Uh, is an interpreter present? No. Okay, so that's a great point, and I literally just had this conversation with a bunch of people on the drive up here, talking to an interpreter and talking to somebody else. This happens a lot in the deaf community. I know it happens in other communities for different reasons. It typically 
happens a lot with oppressed communities, it is a, a instinctual need to agree with authority figures. Deaf people is not even just authority figures. Deaf kids who went to school, they were typically like, hey, we're gonna have a field trip. I need an interpreter to go with me. Oh, it's gonna be really expensive. Are you sure you need an interpreter? Because if you do, you might not be able to go on the trip. Okay, I don't need one. Do that enough your entire life. Cop is like, hey, are you sure you need an interpreter? Because if you do, it's gonna be a while that we're gonna be here. No, it's fine, I'll talk to you. Right? So sometimes that yes and that nine is just, just, it is just a habitual agreement from, from oppressed groups. Um, the other thing, though, that you, you sparked with me was that this is also a sign of a good interpreter. Sometimes deaf people, they can hear a little bit. Sometimes people who speak another spoken language, they know a little bit of English. If I'm interpreting, or when I was, when I was interpreting, if, a, if an attorney asks a question, it's always consecutive, so if they ask a question, I'll do anything, question done, question mark, then I interpret it, and then they answer, and then I say the answer back. It's consecutive when it's the witness who needs the interpreter. If they ask a yes or no question, and the person says yes before I do anything, I put on the record that that, that, that answer came without the interpreter interpreting the question. This gives the judge an opportunity to say, I don't care if you understand a little bit of English, I don't care if you actually could hear a little bit, you could hear that question. I want you to wait and make sure that you get it from the interpreter because you might have misunderstood it, and then we're going to have a problem. So on the spoken language side, how many people that you have in front of you that speak English know what arraignment, reasonable doubt, presumption of innocence? None, right? So if I speak a little bit of English, right? What happens to all those other words? Are they meaningfully participating and getting notice? Are they getting due process? Okay. So, so there's one thing, and I just want to ask a question. But I can tell you, I can tell you what I did. I did. Appropriate or not, interpreter walks into the courtroom, picks up a plea form, goes and gets the defendant, goes and has a conversation with the defendant, comes back in front of the judge. So, so I don't know what the conversation is. So, yeah. Are, are, so here's the problem. Yeah. That's right. What, what I see with that is you're relying on the interpreter to advise the defendant of their rights. And then they're just going to come in front of you and say, oh, yeah, I understand. I'm, I'm waiving all my rights. Remember, you, you're putting that interpreter, or not you, but whoever's putting that interpreter, putting them in a position that they're acting as an attorney. Nobody did. Well, yeah. the interpreter did themselves. On themselves? Okay. Right. Then that's what they're doing. They're basically, and, and sometimes you'll get, obviously, that's why we're looking for a licensed or master certified interpreter, because if they don't know better, they want to help. I mean, you become, I guess you become an interpreter because you want to help people. You want to, you, you want to do the best for these people and make sure that they have access to courts and all that <laughs> stuff. But you've got someone that's interested in trying to help, and they're sometimes looking to give advice. And that's what you run into a lot. And I think the problem is, is that's where you should really try and get the better interpreters, because that in and of itself is not all. That is called sight translation. If a hearing person who speaks English comes in and picks up that paper and reads it all and doesn't want to talk to the solicitor, they don't have to. If the interpreter just interprets, it's called sight translation, if they just interpret it every sentence and that's it, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is because there's a human there, mm -hmm. it is inevitable that the person who the interpreter interprets, you understand you have a right to a, a jury trial? What's that mean? Yeah. Because if I'm reading it myself, I don't have Hey, should I get a jury trial? Right, yeah. So I'm having to ask. If the interpreter is a professional and says, I can't explain that to you, you can go and ask you know, the court, then that's fine. If all they do is interpret the paper, there is nothing wrong with that. That's why the making sure you're not just picking some person like off the street or this interpreter that we've been using forever is really great. How do you know they're great? Right.
Judge, uh, as an officer and a friend of the court, uh, the maximum fine on this is $15. I think the court's overcharging. Well, I went last day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think in this situation, I think, yes, you stand up. And you've, got, you've got to call it out. I mean, if you see stuff like that going on, I'm sure, with obviously, with the training that we're doing now and talking about the rules, I, I think the best thing is to get up there and just say, hey, Judge, I think there's an issue going on, and you may want to check. So you're going to report that to the yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Report to the ASC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, report to I mean, look at these as what would you do if um, I had a, a hearing in front of a judge where I had to have a divorce set aside a year later because of the attorney who did the divorce committed numerous acts of fraud. Um, at the end of it, the judge, everybody's just a judge who asked me, have you spoken to the bar yet? And I was like, well, I'm talking to my client. She's going to have our, we're going to have our own stuff. And she said, well, I'm going to. Right? And you need to put forward all this fraud to have the divorce set aside. And then the judge said, well, guess what? I get to, so I'm going to. Same thing. You have an attorney that comes in your in your courtroom and does something that is a clear, blatant violation. Call the bar. If you have somebody who comes in and is an interpreter is giving legal advice, and they're on the list, right. call the EOC. And if they're not on the list, then but, but this is the contact information for reporting that. Okay? Yeah, the cost. All right, so paying for services, we just have to, of course, pay for services. <coughs> that wasn't the case up till about 2010. Before 2010, the defendant had to pay for his own interpreter. Yes? Some life hacks to help him with money. Schedule the same languages on the same day. Right? It, interpreters are expensive. Trust me. Interpreters are expensive. I'll trust you. I'm not taking money. Um, you didn't record that, did you? Um, interpreters are expensive. Schedule the same. <laughs> Schedule the same interpreters for the same language on the same day. Interpreters charge a minimum. Bring them all in on the same day. Um, you know, uh, have a budgetary line item. You're never going to get everything perfect, but you know, consider it ahead of time. Use remote interpreting when appropriate and available. Consider translating some of those common forms into your most common languages. There's a sample in, in your in your uh, materials. Oh, and the then another thing that I will say, because this has come out a few times, um, this is my own personal hack because I'm I'm tired of agencies skirting. Um, I'm sure as judges, you probably know that. It, most of the time, the courts have contracts with like one agency to provide the interpreter services. If the, if the agency sends you an uncertified, unqualified, fake interpreter, and that causes a problem, who is ultimately on the hook? The court. Something that I've considered recently, because I've experienced this on the other side, agencies will tell courts, I'm not picking anybody out, so I'm not saying all of them. This is just something to be cautious of. Agencies will tell courts, oh, we couldn't get an interpreter because nobody was available. Did they just forget to look and are now telling you, oh, I'm so sorry, nobody was available, right? Like, I don't, there's, a, there's a disconnect with the agencies. I don't think they understand sometimes people are sitting locked up waiting for a first appearance or waiting for a bond. Um, what I think that we should start doing as the court system is when you call an agency for an interpreter and they give you a name, Ask them for all the other names they got first that said no. Because if that's not a master interpreter and it's a conditionally approved interpreter, hey, can you tell me the list of people that you called before you got this person to say yes? Because if that person messes up and that affects that person's rights, and now you have a list, you've protected yourself. And if they lie to you, that is, I mean, can you imagine they're lying and making it up? But I think we start asking the question, maybe you'll start calling people in order. I know for a fact that agencies make more money by sending you less qualified people because they charge you the same even though they pay less. And the way to find out if they're qualified, they're going to have an ID. Okay. They're going to have an ID with their with their level of, of mastery and uh, a number. And that and, number you can check. And especially if they say, oh, sorry, nobody was available. 
oh, okay, great, we understand that happens. Can you give us a list of all the people you did call? Judge Mann? Uh, I came in late, I'm sorry. Um, what happens when you get an interpreter who says, um, I'm, I'm certified by the independent agency and not one of the other? No, they, that's not even a thing. That's not a thing. Okay. That's an ad hoc interpreter. It's, it's an ad hoc interpreter for how you handle it, but if an, if an interpreter says that they were certified by the agency, that's, the kids say, sus. Um, like, I, I, I literally, <laughs> sus, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had a case where I showed up to a municipal court that I was in regularly, on a regular basis, the judge knew me, the clerk knew me, I show up, I'm like, oh, I'm here, and the clerk was like, oh, I just literally walk in, I said, oh, I'm here, and I said, oh, well, somebody's already here. There are 10. Court certified sign language interpreters in the whole state. I told them all. Um, we have dinner. Like, and I was like, I've never seen this person before in my life. So I sit down, okay, I'm Paul. Like, I didn't, like, I didn't just suspect something right off the bat. Maybe they just moved here. So literally, it's like, hi, I'm Paul. You know, like, how long have you been in Atlanta? Oh, like 10 years. Okay. How long have you been working in court? Oh, like three years. Okay, no, you're not. What's your certification? I don't even tell you that. Super red flag. How bad it say that if a random person on the street comes up to me and says, "Hey, what's your sign language interpreter certification?" I have to tell him. Like literally, that's what I have to say. So not telling me super red flag. Casey gets called. He gets up. There's that conversation back and forth because there's not understanding. And he's trying to clarify, but not telling the judge. It's going on for a while. The judge, oh, so great. She corrected him several times, saying, "Sir, if you are going to clarify." Let me know first. So crap. Um, and then it just kept problem, 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 problem. Like two, three minutes go on. I ask the judge to approach. And I go up and I say, Judge, I'm sorry. Like, there's no communication here. It's not clarifying. Like, nothing here is happening. And, and I said to the judge, I said, you know, when I got here, I don't know who this person is. I tried to get to know him. I tried to ask about the certifications. Refused to tell him. Judge said, are you certified? And he said, no, I'm not. I knew that. The next sentence surprised me. The judge said, really? Because you told me you were last week. I was waiting for him to be handcuffs. Um, but, uh, but no, she kicked him out, told him never to return. She contacted that agency, and I hope let that happen. But last week, there was no one there to tell her. And we don't know. I'm an interpreter, but I wouldn't know a good Russian interpreter. Right? Like, uh, we don't know, and there's nobody there to tell us. When you guys go home, I want you to think about the level of trust that you put in interpreters. To not just say the thing that you want them to say, but to say it right, to say it without adding anything, to say it without taking anything away, to say it without having their own personal slant. We're all humans. When I teach interpreters, I tell them, you will never be 100% neutral. The only thing you can do is recognize that you are a human being, recognize the things that make you not neutral, and account for them so that you can account for them. Because if you just go into something like, oh, I'm a interpreter, I'm a neutral, I'm not influenced by anything, you're, you're not even knowing what the heck influences you on a daily basis. The level of trust that we put in interpreters is immense. But you did say earlier that off-brand interpreters come here, they're going to have an ID with Yes. Yes, from yes. now on, they'll have an ID. So that guy would have never had an ID. And he would have been identified through the AOC as an ad hoc interpreter. So. I think we went over our time, but oh, we are. Oh, okay. Do we want to get because we have? He's, he's going to tell jokes. We have no idea how many times we've got to parse this down, but it's hard to parse it down. Okay. Yeah, you guys. Yeah, we can just do questions because that's basically it. Any other questions? I got a question. Yes. Um, Co-defendant trial, two interpreters sharing the same job, basically um, as a team. Can they do that, or is that, is so, that clear? So that's what you were talking about, Paul. So, so. What? Okay. Yeah, so I'll just recap. Uh, he just got, he needs to recap. I'll just recap. So, so you have a trial that is going to be several hours long for several days you are going to have two kinds of roles. Okay, roles is important as the, the number of each role is different. You're going to have what's called a proceedings interpreter. 
They know that the proceedings, every objection, every witness, everything that is said on the record, on the record is important because when there's a bench conference, this is this is the this is the bench. Has anybody had a soccer interpreter in their courtroom? This is the bench. I typically stand right here. Or I used to. I got to take stand right here. When there's a bench conference, I can hear it. I don't interpret. That is a private bench conference, and I'm not announcing that to the defendant or to a party. There could be deaf people in the, in, the, in the audience. I don't I don't interpret bench conferences. Anything that's on the record is interpreted by the proceedings interpreters. And the two of them work as a team with a check and balance. So while I'm actively working, the other person is sitting there, but they're watching me and they're feeding me. They didn't even move their hands because we can communicate in more than one language, right? So if I say something wrong, they might sign to me so that I can make a correction on the fly. That's different than the interpreter for counsel. The interpreter for counsel is the interpreter that interprets between the counsel and their client. It could be the defendant, it could be a petitioner, a respondent, a plaintiff, and a defendant. They interpret between them. Those three groups cannot co-mingle or like they can get together and talk, but they can't mix and match. Proceedings interpreters are there for the court. Uh, petitioner or plaintiff, defendant, they have their own interpreters. You can't move them around. Does that answer your question? Yeah, is there, I, I've read the, I think it's the late case that y'all, it doesn't exactly say that. Is there any other support for that besides, like where, where is the support? So the support for that is that the interpreter shouldn't be doing that. And that, that's interesting, that hasn't been, a, there's no real case for that, but as an ethical interpreter, if a judge said to me, go interpret, I would say, that's a violation of my ethics. I've had, I've had this is tough. Um, not here, because when I came to Georgia, I'm a lawyer. Um, but you know, well, I became a lawyer in Georgia, but I didn't interpret that much here. But I came from Pennsylvania, and I have had nothing against Pennsylvania judges. I love them. But uh, I have had judges where I'm interpreting, and the defendant wants to keep cursing. The defendant wants to keep shouting out, saying something, making comments, and every time they do, I do it. And I've had a judge say, Mr. Penusky, stop interpreting. Then, judge, I need you to ask me to leave the room. I can't stop interpreting. And I understand that you don't want me to say the things that you don't want me to say, but if I am here in this room, I have to. So if you want me to stop interpreting, I need you to ask me to leave the room. And I've had judges threaten to find me in contempt. Um, I, there's, I don't know what to do about it. But if, if a judge said to me, go interpret for that, I would in a very respectful way say that that's a violation of my ethics. Um, that that person is an agent of the attorney, and the example I tell interpreters to use is that that would be no different than that attorney saying, I quit, but you know I'm a judge in this, uh, in this jurisdiction, so now I'll be the judge in this case. Once you're there and you're privileged to that privileged communication, you cannot hop on the other side or become a neutral person. Thanks. Yep. Other questions? No, I think that's it. Oh, good. Look at that. And then we technically ended on time. Thank you.